How y'all doing, good people? Welcome back to another video. Welcome back to the channel. Appreciate y'all stopping by today. We got a lot to cover. But before we dive into financial business, hit that thumbs up button for me. Lock it in with a thumbs up if you guys don't mind. I appreciate you tapping in today. And um, hopefully today we're going to give you some information that can help you build wealth. But before we do that, lock it in with a thumbs up. Hit that thumbs up button for me as well. If you want seven free stocks, Mumu is going to give you seven free stocks, not just any seven free stocks. They're going to give you the Magnificent Seven. They're going to give you seven fractional shares of the Magnificent Seven. All you got to do is deposit $100 in your new Moomoo account. They're going to give you seven fractional shares of the Magnificent Seven. Guys, how can you beat that deal? You're talking about Apple, Microsoft, Meta, Amazon, Alphabet, NVIDIA, and Tesla. You're going to get seven fractional shares of the top seven companies in the S&P 500. All you got to do is open up a new Moomoo brokerage account today, put $100 in that Moomoo brokerage account, and they're going to give you that magnificent seven fractional share stocks. There's a link down in the description box of this video. Go click on that Moomoo link. Open up your new Moomoo account today. Go get that free stock go get that free money. I'm going to also send you two videos, my wealth transfer blueprint, which is going to walk you through my three big boy blue chip paper assets I'm buying in 2024 and beyond to double my net worth. I'm going to also send you the Moomoo tutorial video that walks you through how to use the Moomoo app to make your first trade so that you can start building wealth immediately. But it all begins with that Moomoo brokerage account. So go down to the description box, click on that Moomoo link, open up your new Moomoo account today. Go get that seven, magnificent seven fractional share stocks. They're gonna give that to you free just for trying out the brokerage account, the magnificent seven. Who else is doing that? in the brokerage game. Nobody. Nobody is giving you the Magnificent Seven except Moo Moo. But you got to click on that link, open up your Moo Moo account today, put $100 in it, and go get the Magnificent Seven. Well, guys, we got a lot to uncover today. The White House has went on record and said that our economy is one of the best economies in the last three decades, 50 years. But there's one person that's disagreeing with that. And we're gonna talk about who that one person is. He's not having it. But the White House says there's no better time right now to build wealth. There's no better time to get to your pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. And we're gonna talk about why they believe that. And who doesn't believe it, right? You know there's always two sides to the coin. We're going to talk about both sides of that coin. We're going to also talk about some comments from Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell. He had some comments about interest rates or interest rate cuts. When that's going to happen, if it's going to happen. We're going to talk about that as well. We're going to also talk about what does it, what do you need to have to be considered comfortable in the United States? How much net worth do you need to have to be considered comfortable? We're going to talk about that because there's a survey that's been done that says you're going to need seven figures, guys. We're going to talk about it, though. We're going to break it down and talk about that. And then we're going to talk about some solutions how to get you to wherever you need to be financially in order to have financial freedom, right? Because you guys always know 
my big thing is nobody tells me what wealth should be for me. I get to decide that. No one else. I get to decide. But we're going to talk about that. Then we're going to end the conversation with some information from the BRICS nation and their blockchain project that they're working on, all in an effort to do what? To dethrone the U.S. dollar. So we got a lot to unpack. We're going to dive into it. Um, but before we do that, I want to say something to you guys real quick. I, I, I did a live stream yesterday, and at the end of that live stream, I said a lot of things around uh, us, right? I said a lot of things about, uh, about us, and, and I'm not going to backpedal from those things. I, I felt strongly about those things. I, I, I said what I needed to say. Some of you guys made some comments. I recognize those comments, but at the end of the day, I get a right to, to express my opinion. If you disagree with my opinion, that's okay. But I do get the right to express my opinion. And I think the opinion I expressed is the truth. Everybody won't agree with that, but I believe it was the truth. So I'm not gonna dive into that today. You guys can go back and look at the video from yesterday, the live stream from yesterday, and, 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 and get a sense of what I said. But but we need to wake up. We need to wake up. We got to wake up financially, guys. We got to wake up in every aspect of our life. We got to wake up. And that's all I'm going to say on that matter. We're going to dive into our top story. And here is the headline, guys. Biden says U.S. economy is the world's best. <laughs> Didn't I tell you? Y'all thought I was joking. You thought I was joking with the thumbnail. Y'all thought I was joking with the title of the live stream of the video. You thought I was joking. But, but here's the headline. Biden says U.S. economy is the best in the world. Trump calls it a cesspool. <laughs> Data is clear. So you got the White House on one end saying, we got this amazing economy, the world's leading economy. And then you got another person over here, uh, Donald Trump saying, it's a cesspool. <laughs> so who's right? Who is right? Let's read and figure out both sides of this coin. Both sides of this coin. President Joe Biden is fighting to convince inflation-weary voters that the U.S. economy is healthy. Right? It's an election year. So you know Biden is out there on the warpath. You know his opposition, who is former President Trump, is on the other warpath. So let's see what these two gentlemen are saying about the economy. President Joe Biden is fighting to convince inflation-weary voters that the U.S. economy is healthy. America has the best economy in the world, says Biden. He told NBC's Today Show on Monday, laying out an argument that is central to his re-election campaign. All right, let's keep reading. Let's see what President Biden has to say. America's economic standing in the world is becoming an early flashpoint on the campaign trail, where former President Donald Trump routinely depicts the United States as a commercial wasteland. We are a nation whose economy is collapsing into a cesspool of ruin, Trump shouted at a Georgia rally last month whose supply chain is broken, whose stores are not stocked, whose deliveries are not coming. What do you think about that, guys? What do you think about the former President Trump, the things he's saying about our economy? But the numbers paint a different picture. One more in line with Biden's narrative of American economic dominance than Trump's apocalyptic warnings. 
There you go. Let's read that one more time. Let's read that one more time. But the numbers paint a different picture than what President Trump is saying or former President Trump is saying. One more aligned with what President Biden's narrative of American economic dominance than Trump's apocalyptic warnings. The U.S. gross domestic product was 2.5% in 2023, significantly outpacing that of other developed economies, according to a January report from the International Monetary Fund. The IMF projected that the U.S. will hold that lead in 2024, though it expects GDP to come down to 2.1%. Now, the GDP is important, guys, because it measures the growth of our economy. The better the GDP, the better our economy is doing. Right? Former President Trump says it's a cesspool. It's terrible. But yet and still, in 2023, we did a 2.5% GDP, which led the world. So I'm not sure how you have a cesspool economy, but yet and still, your, your GDP is 2.5%. That's not a cesspool, right? But here's where former President Trump may have a case. Everybody's not participating in that 2.5% GDP growth, right? Everybody, all Americans don't participate, right? So I think that's one angle that the former President Trump, he may be going down the right path there because everybody is not participating in this 2.5% boom economy that President Biden is talking about. Everybody is not participating, the U.S. economy is leading the way for the global economy. It's driving the global economic train. Moody's chief economist said to CNBC, even as interest rates spiked, the labor market has stayed strong. We talked about that yesterday, right? We talked about the ADP numbers coming out for private companies. What uh, what, what are companies doing as it relates to adding jobs to the economy? We talked about that yesterday. Even as interest rates spiked, the labor market has stayed strong. In March, the U.S. private companies added 185,000 jobs. Payrolls processing firm ADP reported on Wednesday, well ahead of the Dow Jones estimate of 150,000 jobs. So analysts said 150,000 jobs will be added, but ADP comes out and says, no, 184,000 jobs are added from private companies, not including government entities and municipalities. That report is coming out tomorrow, right? So the ADP report is just for private companies, publicly traded companies, but the main report which includes government hirings, et cetera, that main report comes out tomorrow, right? That's the jobs report. It is the fastest employment growth the U.S. economy has seen since July 2023. Again, guys, really, really powerful labor market means the Fed won't reduce interest rates anytime soon. We talked about that, and we'll talk about that a little more a little later on when we talk about the Fed and Fed Chair Jerome Powell's comments about what's going on in the economy. The stock market has also made record gains over the past several months, and housing values have soared. All of us sitting around here waiting on the, the, the real estate crash. Guys, Ain't going to be no real estate crash. I keep telling you all that. There ain't no crash coming. The stock market has also made record gains. Remember, we talked about the first three months of two, the first three months of 2024 saw record all time record in the S&P 500. You saw tremendous gains in the Dow. You saw tremendous gains in the Nasdaq. The S&P 500 
10% return in the first 90 days. The Magnificent Seven, 17% 17 return in the first 90 days of this year. And now they're saying over the past several months, housing values have soared, though they have now begun to decline as inventory improves. So as inventory improves in the housing market, what happens to values of homes? They decline. Why? Because you got more inventory to compete with now. When you got more inventory to compete with, that brings prices down. Besides sticky high prices that are projected to cool in the coming year, the fundamentals of the U the fundamentals of the current U.S. economy are nearly ideal. The economy is picture perfect. It's hard to argue with that. So the White House is saying, listen, Americans, what are you crying about? We, we, this economy is the best in the world. There's no better economy than right now. No better economy. What are you complaining about? Get out there and build wealth. There is no better time. It's, it, it won't get any easier for you than, than now to build wealth, to get rich. This is what the White House is saying. No better time. The economy is picture perfect. So what are we complaining about, guys? Why are so many of us down here in this bust economy living paycheck to paycheck if the economy is picture perfect? That comes from the White House. It's hard to argue with it. The U.S. economy recent outperformance is the result of several factors. Now they're gonna lay it out and tell you exactly why our economy is picture perfect. No better time than right now to get super rich. It's super easy to get super rich in this picture perfect economy. Let's lay it out for you why it's picture perfect. The U.S. economy's recent outperformance is the result of several factors. It's both policy and look, said economist Joseph Gagnon of the Peterson Institute for International Economics, a Washington think tank. In response to the economic quake of the pandemic, the U.S. government injected roughly $4 trillion of stimulus into the economy to help support individual households and businesses. $4 trillion was pumped into the economy, guys, during the pandemic years. We had more fiscal stimulus than any other country, and that is part of the reason why the U.S. has recovered from the pandemic depression better than any other country. One of the reasons it's picture perfect is we pumped $4 trillion into the economy for businesses and people like you and me. Four trillion guys, four trillion dollars. That's crazy. A former White House and Treasury Secretary official in both Republican and Democratic administrations currently a guest scholar at the Bookings Institution. America's stimulus safety net came with a hefty price tag, leaving the U.S. with a much larger budget deficit than other countries. Remember, we talked about we got $34 trillion in, yeah, $34 trillion in debt. And a lot of people are saying by the year 2054, it'll be 141 trillion. This is how you get in this type of deficit is when you pump $4 trillion into your economy out of thin air, out of thin air. But picture perfect economy though. That's what they're saying, picture perfect. Let's read on. America's stimulus safety net came with a hefty price tag, leaving the US with a much larger budget deficit than other countries but it's also kept the economy afloat by providing a cushion so that companies did not have to execute 
mass layoffs that might have spiraled into a recession. So you pump all this money into the economy to prevent a recession. And they did that and it worked. The labor market resilience has stuck. The unemployment rate has remained below 4% for the past two years. Now who's right or wrong here? I know there are people saying, nah, you shouldn't have pumped that much money into the economy. But had you not, what was the alternative? Probably a deep recession. Probably a prolonged, a prolonged depression, maybe, right? See, a depression is a prolonged economic downturn. A recession is a temporary economic downturn. So you want a short downturn or you want a long one. Depression is a long downturn in our economy. A, re a recession is a short term, right? One of those two we would have gotten if we had not pumped that four trillion into our economy, right? We had to do something. Of course, we were gonna pay the price at some point and, and we are gonna pay that price. We're starting to see where that price is being paid when it comes to our national debt at 34 trillion, right? We're just kicking that can down the road though to some other time. The labor market resilience has stuck. The unemployment rate has remained below 4% for the past two years, even as the Federal Reserve has sharply raised interest rates. So here's the dilemma. You sharply raise interest rates to one of the highest levels in 40 years, your economy still does what? Two and a half, three percent GDP. And your labor market is resilient. So why would the Fed decrease rates if everything is picture perfect? They wouldn't. They wouldn't reduce rates if everything is picture perfect, right? Let's read on. The U.S. economy's position on the global stage is also a product of its resilience in the face of geopolitical crises and the unique setup of the American financial system. The unique setup of the American financial system. I wonder what that is. What is a unique setup for the American financial system? A unique setup. As Russia's invasion of Ukraine disrupted global energy and food prices, for example, the U.S. was not hurt as much as areas like Europe and Japan, which rely more heavily on Russian energy and food imports. That's the luck part, said Gagnon. See, in the United States, we ain't got to depend on Russia for nothing. We got reserve oil and all that stuff tucked away. We ain't got to depend on Russia for no food. We grow our own food. See, we ain't got to depend on these other countries for nothing like that. That's why a lot of them don't like us. That's why a lot of them are banding together through the BRICS nation to try to destroy our dollar. Because we don't have to depend on them. The world depends on the United States, not the other way around. And companies, I mean, countries don't like that. They don't like that. Russia's invasion of Ukraine disrupted global energy and food prices. See, it didn't, it didn't disrupt our energy or food prices. Now, it did go up, but we wasn't, at a, we wasn't at a situation where we were beholden to them, like some of these other countries, right? For example, the U.S. was not hurt as much as areas like Europe and Japan were, who are reliant on Russia, right, for its energy and food imports. That was the luck. The U.S. economy's resilience is also a result of its unique debt structures. That's one of the perks of being a superpower. That's one of the perks of being the world's reserve currency. That's one of the perks of being the number one economy in the world, right? We have some perks. The U.S. economy's resilience is an also a result of other unique debt structure. The U.S. holds, 
The U.S. households were more insulated from spikes in global rates because of the 30-year fixed rate mortgage, which allowed households to lock in extremely low mortgage rates from the early days of the pandemic. The 30-year mortgage rate, which is mostly unique to the United States financial system, guys. See, these other countries around here, they don't really have that. That's unique to us. That's unique to us, and it protects households as rates later heated up. And, and here's the thing. I thought I saw a, 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 a piece of information that said that, I don't know, 80 or 90 percent of the mortgages are locked in under 6 percent, something like that. I could be off on that number a little bit, but this is what they're talking about. Because, see, a lot of people refinanced and bought homes when rates were super low in 21. In 2021, I sold one of my properties. The person who bought it, which was a family member of mine, locked in a rate at two and a half percent for 30 years fixed. That's what they're talking about here. But that product is unique to the United States. Other countries like in Europe and Asia and places like that, they don't have that product. We do. The American people have that product. And they're saying that product protected a lot of American households. It protected them, which is amazing to me, right? That's one of the opportunities we have in this country. We have some unique financial products that other countries don't have. And that 30-year fixed-rate mortgage is one of them. That's one of the products. Our banking system takes a lot. Our banking system takes a lot of interest rate risks, but in the rest of the world, they shove it on to the household, onto businesses. That was really important. This go around. So what they're saying is our banking system takes on a lot of interest rate risks because of that 30-year fixed rate mortgage. Whereas in a lot of other countries, their banking systems don't take on that risk. They don't give these people these 30-year mortgages. See, when you give somebody a 30-year fixed rate mortgage, you basically taking on a lot of interest rate risk because what happens is you might have, let's say $1 trillion of mortgages you know, under three and a half percent rates automatically go up like they are today, who's at risk? Not the homeowner because they're locked in. It's the bank that's at risk because they've locked these people in at these super low rates. Now prevailing rates are way up here. So the homeowner is protected. They got the super low two and a half percent 30 year fixed rate mortgage. They, they, they're doing great. But bank is the one that's at risk, right? because they got all this money lent out at this super low rate. Now, all of a sudden, rates go up. They can't take that money and do anything with it because it's already locked in. Whereas in other countries, they don't give households or, 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 or people who are looking for loans those types of rates. So that's another good perk of our U.S. economy, of our financial system, right? So even as the U.S. economy stays ahead of the rest of the developed world, there's still room for setbacks in the recovery. I don't think we can conclude that we're, we've soft landed, that we're free and clear. Though inflation has fallen sharply from its 2022 highs, which at the high water mark in June of 22, it was 9.1%, guys. That's the high water mark. It has ticked back up in the past several months. We've talked about the inflation report from January. We talked about the inflation report from February. Now, next week, we're going to talk about the inflation report from March because it's coming out next week. And we're going to see what's going on with inflation because that's going to tell us when the Fed is going to reduce short-term interest rates. For now... The Federal Reserve remains hawkish on interest rates. What does that mean? What does that hawkish mean? That means the Federal Reserve is going to keep rates higher for longer. They're taking a stance of saying, no, 
we're not, we're going to be, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to keep tightening. We're going to keep tightening, keep tightening, keep tightening. Right? We're going to keep tightening, keep rates higher for longer to force inflation down to, to our target rate, which is 2%. The problem is the target rate might be wrong. The target, new target rate might be 3%. May never get it down to 2%, but for right now, they're going to be hawkish, keep rates higher for longer. Right? They're going to be hawkish on interest rates. Despite previous indications, the central bank would issue three rate cuts this year. See how people are starting to backpedal off of that right now. Even the Fed, we're going we're to talk about that in a second. We're going to talk about that in a second, why the Fed is even starting to backpedal on that. On inflation, it is too soon to say whether the recent readings represent more than just a bump, said Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell on Wednesday. Atlanta Federal Reserve President Raphael Bostic now expects just one rate cut this year, likely towards the fourth quarter. That's the federal, that's an Atlanta Federal Reserve president making those statements. What happened to the three? Hawkish, starting to change their stance. We got this picture perfect economy. Why would you reduce rates? You wouldn't. You got this strong labor market. Why would you reduce rates? You wouldn't, right? The road is going to be bumpy, said Bostic on Wednesday in an interview for CNBC's Squawk Box. And while the path of the U.S. economy's recovery is still uncertain, experts are optimistic. We're basically on or above the track where we're on before the pandemic hit. So that's pretty darn good. So who are you going to believe? Your former president, Trump, who says our economy is a cesspool. Or do you believe the current president, Biden, who says the best economy in the world? It's picture perfect. Who do you believe? As an American, as someone living in this country, who do we believe? I think... Who we believe is, is determined by our personal financial stance right now. If I'm up here in the 1% in the boom economy, I tend to agree with President Biden. If I'm in the boom economy, if I'm doing great, if I'm, I'm buying assets, I'm, I'm, I'm increasing my net worth, I probably would tend to agree with President Biden. But if I'm down here in the in the bust economy, I'm living paycheck to paycheck. I got high interest rate credit card debt, student loan debt, barely keeping my head above water. I got no emergency fund. I, I, I might be leaning towards uh, uh, former President Trump might be kind of right. Might be a cesspool for me down here because I'm not participating up here. It might be picture perfect up here in, in, in the boom economy, but down here in this bust economy, it, it could feel like a cesspool. So it depends on, you know, where you, you know, which economy you're participating in is probably where you, you know, where you fall in that argument. It depends. See, for somebody like me who actually participate in this, this boom economy, because why? I, I earn income, I keep it, I take that income, I invest it in assets that grow over time, build wealth, gives me the lifestyle that I want. I have a high income skill set. I'm not living paycheck to paycheck. I don't have any credit card debt. I don't have any car loan debt. I don't have any student loan debt. I got a really healthy emergency fund. I got a stock portfolio. I own real estate. I got a business. See, I'm, I'm participating up here in this boom economy. So to me, economy seems fine. I'm okay. I'm buying assets every day. I'm making money and buying assets every day. I'm okay with that. 
But down here, where a lot of you guys are participating, you're not investing. You're living paycheck to paycheck. The only thing saving you is your job. That's the, that's the saving grace for a lot of Americans is their job, their wages. Because a lot of us have depleted our, our, our personal savings, right? We've depleted them. We have no access to cheap money because interest rates are too high. We can't go get a loan. We can't refinance our house. We can't go buy a new house. We can't put an equity line on the house. Interest rates are all too high. Maybe we were forced to go out and get a new car last year. Seven and a, now if, you, you, if you're a prime borrowing candidate, you're probably in that seven and a half percent range for a car loan. That's a prime. That's an excellent credit borrower. If you're a subprime borrower, not excellent credit, your interest rate is probably 14 to 21 percent right now. That don't feel good every month, especially when you when you when you double that with your upside down in the car. Not only as a prime borrower, your rate is probably 14 to 21 percent, but you're probably upside down in the car as well. So that's a double whammy. I'm paying this jacked up interest rate and I owe more on the car than it's worth. So if you're down there in, in, in this bust economy, that's what a lot of people are feeling. That's why a lot of people are starting to identify with what one of the presidential candidates is saying. Just saying, guys, I, I, I'm not picking or choosing. I'm just telling you, if somebody is telling me I'm living in a in a bust economy, I'm looking, I'm living in a cesspool economy and I'm actually living in a cesspool economy. I, I, you don't got to be a rocket scientist. I might identify with that person. I might. I might identify with somebody that says, listen, I don't care what this guy is saying. Here's what I believe. And if you are living in that lifestyle, if you are living in that economy, you're going to tend to agree with that person. Whether you like him or not, you're going to have to say, well, golly, the guy does make sense. So all I can tell you is, you know, you know, however you flip the coin, it's up to you where it lands. However you flip that coin, it's up to you where, where, where it lands. You can either clean up your financial profile or you don't. I've told you, in my opinion, how you clean up your financial profile. You got to clean up your financial profile. Now, I'm not telling you who to vote for because I really don't care. That's not my thing on this channel. I don't get into that. I'm just giving you two sides of the coin. You flip it. You got two sides. You got one side saying picture perfect economy. Best in the world. Look at all these things we do for you guys that they don't get in the rest of the world. We give you this 30 year fixed rate mortgage. The rest of the world don't get that. We give you four trillion dollars in free money so, so you can survive during the pandemic. The rest of the world didn't get that. I don't know. You tell, I, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just going off of what I'm, what I'm, what I'm reading here. And, 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 and if you want my personal opinion, my personal opinion is going to be skewed because I'm living in the, I, I'm in the, I'm in the boom economy. But now I didn't just roll out of the bed and just roll into the boom economy. No, my financial profile has been cleaned up. My financial profile has been cleaned up to the point where I can participate in the boom economy. But if you don't clean up your financial profile and get yourself in a position where you can participate, where you can get in the game, you, you, what's the other alternative? Could be down here in this cesspool economy. At least that's what former President Trump called it. He called it a cesspool. I can't argue with him on that if I'm paycheck to paycheck, if I'm credit card debt, if I'm car loan debt, if I'm student loan debt, no emergency fund, no, no retirement savings. How can I argue with him when I'm living that? That's the economy I'm living in. 
I'm living in this paycheck to paycheck economy. How can I argue with the guy? It's hard to. It's hard to. And that's what uh, the, the, the Joe Biden better worry about. That's what he needs to worry about. See, he may be talking about this picture perfect economy, but 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 a lot of people ain't living in that picture perfect economy. A lot of these middle class, hard working folk who who the backbone of this country, they not living in that economy. They living down here in this economy. And you got one candidate that is zeroed in on that and smart enough to know that's the angle. That's what we hammer for the rest of this election cycle. That's what we hammer. We hammer the cesspool economy that we know a lot of middle class Americans, lower middle class Americans from an income standpoint are living in. Let's hammer home on that. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. I just thought I'd give you both sides. I wanted to give you why the White House believes they just made it super easy to get rich. Or did they? You got to answer that question. I think they've made it super easy to get rich. I think there's no better opportunity than right now to get rich. But you got to get your financial profile together. You got to clean up your financial house. You got to clean it up. If you don't clean it up, you, 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 you never get you never get to this picture perfect economy, guys, is all I'm saying. You never get there. There is a picture perfect economy out there. But the only way you get access to it is you got to clean up your financial profile. No one's going to clean it up for you. Now, I know one guy is saying there's a cesspool, but that guy or that guy, neither one of those guys can clean that up for you. You got to clean it up for you. But you can participate in that other economy if you want. But it's up to you. You got to you got to put your flag in the sand. You got to draw your line in the sand. And, and start changing something in your financial life if you want to take advantage of this boom economy. You got to change something in your financial life, guys. You got to change something in your financial life. Let's talk a little bit about the Federal Reserve and, 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 and what Chair Powell said in some of his comments yesterday. Here's the headline. Fed Chair Jerome Powell pumps brakes on rate cuts. Now, isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? We just talked about that yesterday. Isn't that interesting? Now, Fed Chair Powell pumps brakes on interest rate cuts. The Federal Reserve will see if inflation moves beyond its current rough patch before imposing highly anticipated interest rate cuts. Fed Chair Jerome Powell said on Wednesday, just yesterday, guys, just yesterday, addressing a business conference in Stanford University, Powell touted progress in the fight to cool price increases while acknowledging that such headway had stalled in recent months. Our inflation it's too soon to say whether the recent readings represent more than just a bump, Powell said. Given the strength of the economy, see, here we go again, this picture-perfect economy, this picture-perfect economy. For who? Even he just said it. Given the strength of the economy and the progress on inflation so far, we have time to let the incoming data guide our decisions on policy. And all he means on policy is on rate cuts. See, this is what is stopping the rate cuts, guys. The strength of the economy, which is no different than what Biden said, best economy in the world. Picture perfect. That's all strength of the economy means. We got this strength of the economy and the progress on inflation thus far. We have time. So what they're basically saying is as long as the economy is strong, as long as the labor market is strong, we're not going to cut rates. We can wait because we still believe 2% is the target, even though I believe 3% is the new target for inflation, right? But they don't believe that. They got time to wait. 
We have time to let the incoming data guide our decision. What's that incoming data? You got a jobs report tomorrow. You got a CPI inflation report for March next week. Those two pieces. Then you're going to have PPI. Then you're going to have uh, PCE. All of that data they're waiting on. And then they're going to go into what? May in the May meeting with all that data. Right? That's what they're waiting on. Inflation has fallen significantly from a peak of 9.1%. But it remains more than a percentage point higher than the Fed's target rate of 2%. That target rate may not ever happen, guys. And, and I'll be glad when the Fed realizes that. That target rate may never happen. The new target rate probably is 3%. And the Fed has to get comfortable with that. Clearly, they haven't. Clearly, they still believe they can get it down to 2% and they're willing to keep rates higher for longer to do it. And the only reason they're justified in doing that is because we got a strong labor market and we got a picture perfect economy. Right. At a meeting last month, the Fed opted to keep rates highly elevated. The Fed funds rate remains between 5.25 and 5.5, matching its highest level since 2001. You're talking about 23 years, guys. Over 20 years. It's at its highest level it has ever been. Over 20 years. That's crazy. The move marked the fifth meeting in a row at which the Fed has left rates unchanged. So that tells you something, guys. They're not moving rates up anymore. You ain't got to worry about that unless something catastrophic happens. They're not moving rates up anymore. The problem is when they don't move rates down, they eliminate a certain supply of money. Right. They eliminate it. What is that supply of money that they eliminate? Borrowing money. They eliminate the ability to borrow money, which is an important supply of money to our economy. But for who? The people down here in this bust economy. See, the people in the boom economy don't rely on loans as much as people in the bust economy does. The, the, the one percenters don't rely on loans that much, guys, because they got assets. They got assets that produce income. They got high income skill sets. They got businesses. They don't necessarily need to go borrow money to just make ends meet. The people living down here in this bust economy, in this cesspool economy as former President Trump called it, a cesspool. <laughs> in the cesspool economy, guess what? They need to borrow money to, to make ends meet. They do. Right now, the Fed ain't giving that to them. It's not giving it to them. They're saying, no, we're not going to turn that faucet back on. We're not going to turn that, that, that money faucet on just yet. We're going to keep, keep rates higher for longer until we're comfortable that inflation has been defeated. Right. The move marked the fifth meeting in a row at which the Fed has left interest rates unchanged, marking a prolonged pause on the aggressive rate hiking cycle that started in March of 22. The Fed said last month that it still intends to make three interest rates cuts this year. Just said that last month. What's changed? What has changed, guys? The Fed's next rate decision will take place at the beginning of May. Now, in May, the beginning of May, they're going to have some data. They're going to have all of the March data. Right? They're going to have all of the March data. And we'll see. We'll see. I think next week, if that CPI inflation report for March comes out and it shows inflation still being sticky, or slightly increasing, it's just a game changer, man. It's going to be a game changer. On Wednesday, Powell said that the central bank faces risks whether it cuts interest rates too early or too late. Reducing rates too soon or too much could result in a reversal in the progress we've seen on inflation and ultimately require even tighter policy to get inflation back to 2%. So basically what he's saying is, if we lower rates too fast, 
too soon, inflation might go from 3%, it might go back up to 5%. And then guess what we got to do? Turn around and then increase rates again. That's what he's saying they're trying to avoid. That's what they're trying to avoid, right? But easing policy too late or too little could unduly weaken economic activity and employment. So what they're basically saying is if you keep these people down here in the bust economy, in the cesspool economy, if you keep them down there too long without access to borrowing money, it may stop them from spending money altogether and push us into a recession. So you got a little tightrope back there. You don't want to you don't want to increase rates, but you don't want to hold rates higher for longer too long because it, 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 it doesn't give these people down here access to cheap money, which they then use to pump back into the economy through buying goods and services. Tightrope back. He added as conditions evolve, monetary policy is well prepared to confront either of the risks. Interest rate cuts would lower borrowing costs for consumers and businesses. I just told y'all that. See, interest rate cuts will introduce a new supply of money to our economy, which is borrowing money for businesses and consumers. That is not happening right now. Potentially triggering a burst of economic activity through greater household spending and company investment. Haven't I always told you guys, businesses borrow money to do what? They invest in their growth. But when money is too expensive to borrow, they don't grow. Most companies in America don't grow if they can't borrow money to invest in that growth. Everybody doesn't have uh, cash reserves like Apple. Everybody don't have cash reserves like Microsoft, NVIDIA, Meta, Amazon, Alphabet. Tesla, everybody don't have the Magnificent Seven cash reserves. Most of these companies borrow money to grow, to invest in growth. Most consumers borrow money just to live. Just to live. Because most of us don't have personal savings. Most of us don't have retirement savings. All we have is our job. And when our job, the income on the job is not sufficient, what do we do? We borrow money to, 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 to make up the shortfall. And this is what the, the, the chairman is saying here. See, this is what the chairman is saying, potentially triggering a burst of economic activity. If we lower waste, if interest rate cuts, if interest rate cuts would lower borrowing costs for consumers and businesses, potentially triggering a burst of economic activity through greater household spending and company investment. But the Fed risks a rebound of inflation if it cuts interest rates too quickly, since stronger consumer demand on top of solid economic activity could lead to an acceleration of price increases. All they're telling you there is if you if you introduce rate cuts too soon and people start borrowing again and shoving money back into the economy, buying crap, what's going to happen to supply and demand? Supply goes, I mean, say demand goes through the roof. Supply can't keep up. Prices go up, a.k.a. inflation goes up. So that's what the Fed is concerned with. They got a, they got a reason for not wanting to do this so quickly. U.S. job gains far exceeded expectations in February, and it appears they're going to far exceed expectations in March. So we still got a red hot labor market. U.S. job gains far exceeded expectations in February. U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics data earlier this month show the U.S. added 275,000 jobs in February, surpassing predictions of about 200,000 jobs. That includes government jobs, right? But marking a substantial decline from hiring of roughly 350 workers in January. The S&P 500 reached all-time highs last month. Attitudes about the economy have improved in recent months. Of course it has. You got the president coming on record saying, best economy in the world. You got other people saying, picture-perfect economy. You got the stock market at all-time highs. 
You got a resurgence in home prices. You got a, you got a bullish labor market. Why wouldn't people think that we got a great economy? Yet and still, you got millions and millions and millions and millions of people down here in this bust economy or this cesspool economy struggling. Attitudes, around, attitudes about the economy have improved in recent months. Consumer sentiment inched lower in February, but reserved much of the large gains achieved in previous months. Still, some areas of the economy have cooled. The housing market has slowed, not from a price standpoint, but from transactions. That's what they're talking about. The housing market has slowed substantially due to large part to soaring mortgage rates. Prices aren't coming down, but transactions of sold homes has cooled off tremendously. Tremendously cooled off, almost non-existent, right? The average interest rate for 30-year fixed rate mortgages have soared to almost 7%. Speaking on Wednesday, Powell referred to surveys of consumer and business sentiment that suggest inflation is widely expected to return to normal levels. The public does believe, and it's a good thing, because it's true that inflation will go down to 2%, Powell said. That's very reassuring, but that's partly because of the strong action we took and also because of our ongoing commitment to actually returning inflation to 2% over time. And that is our commitment, Powell said. There you go, man. So he's thinking the American people are okay with rates higher for longer. I don't know if I believe that, guys. I'm not sure who he's talking to, what American people he's talking to, maybe the one percenters, but the people down here in this bust economy, in this cesspool economy. Now, the people up in this boom economy, in this, this boom economy, in this picture-perfect economy, they probably agree with him. But these people down here in this cesspool, in this bust economy, I don't know. I don't know if I'm living paycheck to paycheck and I got credit card debt upside down in my car loan. I got a 14 to 21 percent loan rate for my car. I got no emergency fund. I got no retirement savings. I'm not sure if I agree with him. As far as I'm concerned, reduce rates now. Let me get access to me some cheap money so I can get myself right sized. I don't know. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see in the coming in the coming months. We'll see. Right. We'll see. Well, here's what. A lot of people think. Matter of fact, Gen Xers think that they'll need 1.6 million to live comfortably in retirement. That's what people are saying right now. We need 1.56 million dollars just to live comfortably. How many of y'all right now got 1.56 million dollars? How many of y'all got 1.5 million dollars? in your retirement. They're saying that's what you're gonna need. I'm just telling you what, what the survey is saying. How many of y'all got $1.5 million right now? Somebody in the chat, y'all jump in and tell me. If you're not too embarrassed, tell me what your, 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 your net worth is. Because this thing right here is saying you're gonna need 1.56 mil. Just to survive. You're going to need 1.56 mil just to survive. It, it'll take a lot of money for most Americans to feel comfortable retiring. And many of them are way behind. But yet and still, we got this picture perfect economy. Best economy in the world. Now, now help me out here. How can we have the number one economy in the world, but we got so many people not participating in it? And when I say participating, I'm talking about building wealth. It'll take a lot of money for most Americans to feel comfortable retiring, and many of them are way behind. A new Northwestern Mutual survey conducted by the Harris Poll from January 3rd to January 17 reveals how much Americans think they might need to enjoy life after working. 
And that price tag just keeps growing. Y'all think I'd be just pulling this stuff out of thin air, man. Y'all think I'd just be on here tripping out. I'm telling y'all, man, this ain't me. This is what Americans are thinking. This is what your fellow Americans are saying. Not me. Your fellow Americans that have been surveyed. This is what they're saying. According to the survey, Americans set their sights on 1.46 million as the magic number to make them feel comfortable in retirement. Again, if that's what your fellow Americans are saying, I'm asking you, how much do you have? Do you have at least 1.5 million in your pot of gold at the end of the rainbow? These folks are saying that's what you're going to need. And it differs by generation. Both Gen Z and millennials said they would feel comfortable retiring with 1.6 million. So the younger you are, the more they feel you're going to need. Gen X thinks 1.56. Baby boomers, 990,000. Well, even at the 990,000, let's say you get a million bucks, you get a 6% rate of return pre-tax that generates $60,000 a year in income. Is that enough? Even if you're a baby boomer, is that enough? I don't know. You got to answer that. You got to know what you're trying to generate in cash flow and income when you get to the golden years. Only you know that. I'm just giving you some of the statistics, what people are saying. If you're a Gen Z and a millennial, you need 1.6. If you're a Gen X, and I think that's me, I think I fall into the Gen X, that's a 1.56. If you're a boomer, they're saying you need just a hair under a million bucks. For those with high net worths, with incomes over a million, their expectations were much higher at 3.93 million. So if you're someone out there that's making over a million dollars a year, you believe you need about four mil. But all of those are hundreds of thousands, if not millions, off from how much each cohort actually has saved. So you got these people saying, yeah, I'm a Gen, I'm a, I'm, I'm, I'm Gen X, I'm Gen Z, and a millennial, I need 1.6. The problem is they have none of that saved. They got none of it, or very little of it. They're hundreds of thousands of dollars off the mark. When you talk about Gen X, hundreds of thousands of dollars off the mark. When you talk about boomers, off the mark. Check this out. But all of those are hundreds of thousands of, but all of those are hundreds of thousands if not millions, off from how much each cohort actually has saved. For instance, Gen X has, on average, just $108,000 in retirement. Now, Gen X, when surveyed, said they need 1.56 to feel comfortable in retirement. But the numbers say average Gen X has about $108,000 in retirement. 1.5, that's what they say they need. One, 108,000 is what they actually have. Somebody, is that a disconnect there? Is there a disconnect somewhere there? What people think they need and what they actually have? Y'all better help me out here. I know I'm talking to somebody in this chat. I, I know somebody that's resonating with somebody because you all fall in those three categories. You're going to fall into a, 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 a Gen Z or whatever they call them, millennial, X, and then boomer. You got to fall in there somewhere. Check this one out. That's less than generation's average household pre-tax income of 126. So you got Gen X making about $126,000, $127,000 a year in pre-tax income, but they only got about $108,000 in savings. What are they doing with their money? What, 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 do, what do people do with their money when they're making this kind of money and they have relatively no retirement savings? What, what, what are people doing? 
With the big gap between the Gen X retirement goals and their current savings, 42% of them believe they could outlive their savings. Gen X also participates, Gen X also anticipates retiring later than other generations. On average, Americans anticipate retiring at age 65. Gen Z thinks it'll be 60 for them, but Gen X anticipates throwing in the towel at 67. See how you're getting moved back further and further? See? Further and further back. I mean, listen, guys, there ain't nothing wrong with working at 60 or 65 or 67 if that's what you want to do. But it's a difference when I'm forced to work at that age. It's one, it's, it's, it's one, when I, one choice I make to work at that age when I'm already got enough retirement and I'm good to go, but I just choose to keep working because I love what I do. That's a different mindset. But if I'm 67 years old and I'm forced to go to work, that's not good. That's not good. That's not good. Not if I'm forced to. Now, if I make the choice because I got financial security, but I still choose to work because I love what I do, that's different. While it's hard to pinpoint an exact number that would make Americans across generations feel comfortable retiring, the Wall Street Journal, Journal pointed to a method by Fidelity Investments that suggests people should save 10 times their annual salary by age 67 with the aim of hitting savings worth six times their annual salary at age 50. As the Wall Street Journal notes, Lower income Americans might be overestimating how much they need for retirement. So you, you got you got one, you know, investment firm saying you should have 10 times your annual salary at 67 saved. 10 times your annual salary. So if your annual salary is 100K, you need 10 times that in your retirement at 67. That's what they're saying. But still, how many of us have that? How many of us are 67 years old right now? And, 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 and let's just say our, our annual salary was 100K. How many of us got a million right now? That's the key. That's the point. For example, as back, for example, as back of the envelope calculation, the average annual household income for Gen Xers is 126,892 per BLS. Using Fidelity's formula, Gen Xers would need to save over 761,000 by 50 to be on track to save enough for age 67. While that's still much more than they have saved now on average, it also quite a bit lower than their estimation in the Northwestern Mutual Survey. Right, because they're thinking 1.5. But in actuality, if they're making 126 k a year, you, you're going to be in that 1.2, 1.3 range. But the problem is, in either hypothetical, they don't have that much at all. They don't have it at all. Like I said, average of 108,000. So you're 67 years old. You got $109,000 in your retirement. Only thing you can depend on that point is you got two choices. You can keep working or you, you take your little Social Security and you make it, you make it work. Because $100,000 in retirement is not going to generate enough income to do anything significant in your life. It's not. Your Social Security benefits will be more than what the $100,000 will generate for you guys. 100,000 at 6% rate of return is $6,000 a year. That's $500 a month. That's what $100,000 would generate for you in retirement. It's $500 a month. The average Gen X has $108,000 in retirement. So that's a lot of people, guys. A lot of people who are under underfunded in their retirement. 
They're not prepared for retirement. They're just not prepared. The high numbers the survey respondents targeted for retirement could reflect the tough conditions in the U.S. economy. Oh, hold on now. Hold on. What are you talking about? The tough conditions in the U.S. economy. I, I just I just read you something where the president said we got the best economy in the world. I just read you something where we got the picture perfect economy. But now you go to this article where the real people are at, where the, where the, where the, where the, where the, 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 the rubber meets the road. And now this article is saying they're calling our economy a tough, tough conditions. Who do you believe? This is what I'm telling you. It depends on which economy you're living in. I keep telling y'all there are two economies. Some of y'all don't want to believe me. There are two economies, guys. You got a really good economy up here that they call picture perfect. I call it the boom economy. And then you got a really, 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 really bad economy down here that they call a cesspool. Well, at least that's what former President Trump called it, a cesspool. And I like to call it a bust economy. So you got these two economies. One article is saying when you're talking about common folk, when you talk about 99 percenters trying to save for retirement, they call our economy a tough condition economy. Why? Because you're talking to the everyday population who are down here in this cesspool economy. So now you call the economy tough, tough conditions. But in the other article, when we were talking about the best economy in the world, we called it picture perfect. <laughs> I mean, which economy are we in here? I'm trying to tell you guys, you better figure it out. You better figure out which one you're living in. You better figure out which one you're living in. The high numbers the survey respondents targeted for retirement could reflect the tough conditions in the U.S. economy. While the pace of inflation is slowed following the pandemic, it's still above the Federal Reserve's target 2%, as many Americans continue to struggle with high costs restraining their wallets, especially for necessities like housing, food, insurance, and utilities. There you go. There you go. Whole different economy right here they're talking about, aren't you? Yeah, different than the one we just talked about. The one we just talked about in the other article is picture perfect. Whoo! It's strong. I mean, what did, you, what, what did Jay Powell call it? Strong economy. The strength of our economy. That's what Jay Powell called it. Jay Powell said we got a strong economy. But in this article, it's saying, eh, not really. It ain't, not, not for us, it ain't. So you got to figure it out. Got to figure it out. Got to figure it out. Gen X is also facing their own tough economic plight as the forgotten generation. Millennials and Gen Zers both started saving earlier for retirement than their Gen X peers and are more confident that they'll be financially prepared for retirement. Meanwhile, Gen Xers on the whole feel less financially secure than other generations. There you go, guys. I, I don't know. You got to figure that one out. You got to figure out which one of these economies you're living in. My guess is a bunch of us are living down here in this other economy that's not doing as well. That would be my guess. And all of those retirement fears and meager savings come as retirement is increasingly out of reach for many Americans. The retirement crisis is already a reality for some older adults with just over half of Americans over 65 earning less than $30,000 a year and are forced to rely on Social Security and continued work to get by. Are you trying to tell me you didn't gave, you're 65 years old, you've given all of this this working for your whole life, you get to 65 and you're making less than $30,000 a year and you're forced, well, you got to take Social Security and then a lot of times people are forced to, to continue working. 
What do you, what, 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 what's the alternative, guys? What is the alternative? The situation might only worsen as Social Security benefits remain in peril and student loan debt and other financial pressures grow. What are those other financial pressures? Credit card debt, no emergency fund, high interest rate car loan debt. Yeah, those are some of the other pressures that a lot of people are facing. So there you go, man. What, what, wherever you're at on that spectrum, whether you're a young person, right? You're saying you need 1.6 if you're a young person, $1.6 million. Problem is most of them don't even have close to that right now. So, so a younger person thinks they need 1.6. Person my age thinks 1.5. Person a little older than me, boomers, think a million. The problem is no matter where you fall in that category, none of those people, when you look at their savings, are on track to hit any of those numbers. They're not even on track. So then when you get to reality at 65, when reality sets in, reality says half of people 65 years or older live on less than $30,000 a year. That's the reality. So we can say what we want to say over here, but if our effort and attitude doesn't match this, we end up at 65 making $30,000 a year and are forced in a lot of cases to keep working. Because see, over here, we have an idea what it takes. We just don't have a plan. We don't execute nothing to get that number. You got to execute something, guys, if you want $1.6 million in your pot of gold at the end of the rainbow when you get to the golden years. You just don't wake up one morning and it's sitting in there. Uh-uh. You're going to do something to generate that. You just don't wake up generation X and you have $1.5 million in your pot of gold at the end of the rainbow generation X. You just don't wake up one morning and it's there. Baby boomers, you don't just wake up one morning and you got a million dollars in your pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Uh-uh-uh. You got to have a plan and then you got to execute that plan in order to get there. Or what's your alternative? According to the article, the alternative is half of you guys, when you get to 65, you're going to be living on $30,000 or less. That's the alternative. So what do you do? You got to put a plan together. Y'all think I'd be on here every day talking about moo moo and talking about this and talking about that, ETFs, uh, buying real estate. Y'all th think I'd just be on here talking about that? No, I talk about that because that's what you need to be executing if you want to get to that 1.6 uh, Gen Z, millennials, Gen X. You want to get to 1.5 boomers if you want to get to a million. You're going to do something. You got to take your income now while you're actively earning income. You got to take that income and, and sacrifice something. Give up something to be able to put that money in something to grow it over these next 10, 15, 20 years. So that when you do get to 65 or 60 or 55, whatever your number is, when you get there, you got enough money and assets to take care of you that generates more than $30,000 a year like some of these folks. And, 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 and honestly, guys, that $30,000 a year, some of that is probably Social Security. Probably Social Security. It says the average American across all spectrums, the average American at retirement lives on $50,000 a year. Average American. But that includes Social Security. Now, what if they say, you know something, guys, we're not going to let you get Social Security at 62. The Social Security fund is being depleted. We got to we got to kick the can down the road. Now you can't get Social Security till you're 67. That's the early 62. No longer is early. Early now is 67. What are y'all going to do? If you don't have assets, if you've not built some other type of wealth that generates money. What are you going to do? 
Better figure it out. Better figure it out. Better figure it out, guys. It, this is serious stuff. That's the reason why I'm on here every day trying to give you guys this information so that you can use the information to get to your pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. That's the whole point here. The whole point is not me on here to entertain you. It's actually to give you information that you can say, well, okay, well, shoot. Okay, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a millennial. And shoot, if I'm gonna need 1.6, how much do I got today? Shoot, I only got 150, but I need 1.6. I'm way behind. What do I need to do over the next 20 years to get myself from this $150,000 net worth to this $1.6 million net worth? What do I need to do? Well, here's what you need to do. You need to earn. You need to get out there and earn as much as you can earn. High as you can go. And then what do you need to do? You need to keep what you earn. You need to live a modest, simple lifestyle. Give up something. Sacrifice something. Earn as much as you can earn and keep as much as you earn. So if I'm earning $100,000 a year, my goal should be at least 30% gross. I should be taking $30,000 a year out of that 100. Minimum, put it into something. And if I do that, if I do that, let's talk about if I do that though. Let's talk about if I do that. Let's say I do that for the next 20 years at an 8% rate of return. This is for some of you millennials out there who, who are a little bit younger. I know because I cause, oh, I don't got 20 years. I'm already 60. How do I got 20? I'm not talking about everybody. I'm talking about a millennial for right now. Younger people taking 30,000. Let's say you're making a hundo. Let's say your family, your, 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 your family is making a hundo. I take 30 of that hundo. And I do that for 20 years. I got one point. I got 1.377. So I'm still short because I need 1.6. So I need more than $30,000 a year going in investments if I'm, a, if I'm a millennial. Let's say $35,000. Ah, so I need $35,000 a year if I'm a millennial. I need $35,000 a year going into an investment that'll give me an 8% return over the next 20 years. So $35,000 a year for 20 years, on average 8% rate of return, I got 1.6 million, I'm there. So if I'm a millennial, Gen Z, whatever they, whatever, I just call them young folks. If I'm a younger person and I'm okay with a 20 year window, all I got to do now is say, well, okay, I know all I need. 35000 a year is the number. I sacrifice everything financially to get that 35000 every year. Whatever I got left over, that's what I live my lifestyle on. The first thing I do is I take that money, that 30, I'm making hundred k a year, I'm taking thirty five of it. And I'm investing it. I got to get an 8% return. Because I know if I can do that for 20 years as a young person, guess what? I got my 1.6 million. Now, if I'm an older person, if I'm a person like me, right, uh, uh, what they call a Gen X, older person like me, and I, I ain't got 20 years, I ain't got 10 years. Let's say I got 10 years. Let's say I'm, let's say I'm 52 and I want to be done at 62 because I'm a little older. I ain't got 20 years like the, like the young folk. I got 10 years. How much money do I need to be putting away to get to the 1.5 million? Because that's what I need, right? What do I need to be putting away to get to that 1.5 million? How much do I need to be putting away every year? Now, technically, you should be making more money than a millennial. Not, not, not in every case, but, but you should be. Or, or you should be farther along, but, but, but let's say you're not. And you need the 1.5, and you got to do it in 10 years. You ain't, got, you ain't got 20 years. You want to do it in 10 years. How much money should you be putting away? 
right? How much money should you be putting away every single year for the next 10 years? Now, you may have to stretch it out a little bit, though, because some of y'all may not be able to do this. Okay, you need to be putting away at least 100K a year. If you're a Gen X, my age, in that 50 range, and you're saying, Richard, I ain't got 20 years. I got to do it in 10, and I got no net worth right now, but I got a good income. I got the ability to make more income through side hustles. And I'm willing to pay the price. I'm willing to sacrifice something financially. I'm willing to delay gratification. You need $100,000 a year if you want to do it in 10 years. You need $100,000 a year every year for 10 years. At an 8% rate of return, you'll be at $1.5 million. So if I'm a 50-year-old person, Gen X, and I'm, I, I want to be done at 60, I got 10 good years left in me. I got 10 years worth of fight in me. I got 10 years worth of delayed gratification, giving up vacations, giving up niceties, only buying needs. I got 10 years. I got a good income and the ability to make more. I take $100,000 a year. I throw it in an S&P 500 ETF that tracks the S&P 500 index. I get me an 8% rate of return. I'm locked and loaded, 10 years, pot of gold, got 1.5 million in it. Now, boom, I'm done. So I don't care where you're at, guys, on, the, on, on this list. I don't care how young, how old. If you're willing to pay the financial price, you can get there, is my point. You can get there. But you got to be willing to pay the financial price. Are you willing to pay the financial price? You got the president saying we, we got the best economy in the world, which I agree with him. We do have the best economy in the world. Why more people don't take advantage of that? I just think it's programming. It's programming. It's your behavior with money is why people don't take advantage of this. Because we do. I agree with him 100%. We do have the best economy in the world. We do have a financial system where you can drop anybody in that financial system who are willing to do what? Change the way they think about money, adapt some financial principles and some financial behaviors, and they can go to the moon if they want to. I believe that's the financial system we have here in the United States. I don't care what color you are. I don't care what, what you're male or female. I, I, I don't care how old you are. I, I, I don't, I, none of that matters. They can drop you right in there if you got the right behavior with money, you got these financial behaviors and these financial principles that I preach and talk about all the time on this channel. If you do those things and you do it long enough, man, come on. Ain't no stopping you. The problem is in this country, we're so conditioned to not want to do any of that, but just live for today. We only want to live for right now. We don't want to worry about tomorrow. We only want to live for right now. That's all we want to do. We just want to live for right now. We don't worry about tomorrow. We don't plan for tomorrow. We don't. That's why many of us don't participate in this boom economy because it's there. Many of us choose to participate in the cesspool or the bust economy because that's instant gratification down here, see? Most people you see up here in this economy, they gave up something. They delayed gratification. They gave up something. They gave up something financially to get here. It was a fight, but they got here. Now they get to enjoy it for the rest of their life. Most people down here, a lot of people down here ain't willing to give up anything financially. They live for today. These people up here live for the future. They live for tomorrow. Down here, we just live for right now and we live in the past. We live in the past and we live for right now. That's all. We just live right here in the past. Future, past. Right? Paid the price, don't want to pay a price. Delayed gratification, don't want to delay gratification, want instant gratification. Just telling you, that's what separates these people who live in the who live in the 
boom economy from the people who live in the bust economy? What separates them? Delayed gratification, executing a plan, changing mindset, making income, keeping that income, investing that income in assets year after year, decade after decade. That's what they do up here. Down here, most people live paycheck to paycheck. They live instant gratification lives. They have not given up anything or sacrificed anything financially. They have not executed a financial plan. They, a lot of people have no plan. So, so, so it's not that hard to, to, to take yourself from here to here. But you got to do some fundamental things to do it. You got to change your behavior with money. You got to think more long term instead of short term. That's another big problem. See, these people up here are mostly long term thinkers. A lot of us down here are short term thinkers. We think about, OK, I put one hundred dollars in something. I want something back tomorrow. What do I get back tomorrow? I, I put it in one hundred dollars. I get when, when, when do I cash it out? You know how many times I've gotten that from people who, who start buying paper assets? They start buying paper assets. They ain't, been, they ain't even been doing anything for a month. And the first question they have is, is when do I sell it? When do I sell it? And, and I got to ask them, well, well guys, you, you, you put $100 in. If you sell it now, how much income does that generate for you? Oh, not that much. Well, why would you sell it? The goal is, is do you, you put more in, you build it up, and then when it gets to a point where you can calculate, okay, I got, uh, okay, got $500,000 in here at 6%. Okay, shoot, that $500 is going to generate $30,000 in income. That's good enough for my lifestyle. That's when you sell it. But you don't sell it one month in and you putting $100 in. But that's, that's, that's the mentality, though. That's the mindset. See, that's the trap. Because we're, 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 we're instant gratification. And, and, and you will never build wealth unless you get out of that instant gratification mentality and get yourself into a delayed gratification mentality. That's, that's one of the biggest separators between wealthy, not wealthy. Their ability to laser focus in on being delaying gratification, their ability to laser focus on earning income, their ability to be laser focused on spending as little as that income as they have to spend to live. And then they take the rest of it and they put in assets and they're laser focused on patience. If you don't have those qualities, guys, get them there. You can get them. But you got to commit yourself to it, right? Well, guys, I appreciate you. Thank you all for rocking with me today. Like I said, if you want those magnificent seven free stocks, guys, you got to get down to the description box and click on that Moomoo link if you want the magnificent seven free stocks. Moomoo is going to give you the magnificent seven in fractional share stocks. All you got to do is open up that Moomoo account, click on that link in the description box, click on the Moomoo link, open it up, put $100 in there. Put $100 in there and Moomoo is going to give you seven fractional share stocks, the magnificent seven, the top seven companies in the S&P 500, all big boys, all blue chip. How are you going to beat that deal? Who else is going to give you seven free stocks of the magnificent seven fractional shares? Who? Who else? Name another brokerage company giving you that for free for just trying out their brokerage app. None of them. Get down to that description box. Click on that Moomoo Moo link right now. Open up that Moomoo Moo account. Put you some money in it. If you are down here in this cesspool bust economy and you want to change something in your life, change it today. What are you waiting on? Why do something today? Why do something? Why do something tomorrow you can do today? Why do something tomorrow you can do right now? Click on the link, download the app, sign up, transfer $100 in there, boom. You're going to get the Magnificent 7 
fractional share stocks. And then now it's time to do what? Delay gratification, discipline yourself, be consistent, be patient, earn money, keep as much of it as you can keep, and then invest it. And I've told you what you do. If you're, if you're, a, if you're a millennial, do it for 20 years. Put your $35,000 away for 20 years and an 8% gainer on average. You got 1.6 million in 20 years. So if I'm a 25 year old, if I'm a 30 year old and I got some patience, I'm 30 years old. I can go from 30 to 50 and I got 1.6 million. All I'm doing is putting in $35,000 a year and an 8% gainer like an S&P 500 that tracks the S&P 500 index. If I'm, a, if I'm a Gen X, I'm a 50-year-old guy, 50-year-old gal, and I ain't got 10 years, but I'm an earner. I got a little wherewithal. I got the ability to add more income. Take 100K, 10 years, same exercise, 8% rate of return, 100K, 1.5 million, right? That's all you gotta do. So it ain't, it, 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 you know, up here, intellectually, it's a process that everybody can do. Where we get hung up is discipline, consistency, and patience. See, we get hung up. A lot of us don't have that financially. But if you want to get to your pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, I just gave you two scenarios, and most of us fall in those two scenarios. Yeah? I, either, you, either you're a millennial or, or, or a Gen Z, or you're an X. Most of us fall in that category because most boomers are already retired or, or, or right there. So most of the people I'm talking to today are going to be millennials, Gen Z, Gen X. If you want to change something in your life financially, do it now. Get down that description box, click on that Moomoo link, get your, get your Magnificent Seven free stocks, fractional shares, Limited time offer. Don't delay. Act today. Why do something tomorrow you can do today? Click on the link. Open it up. Now, guess what? Start putting some money in there. And then send me an email and say, hey, man, I opened my Moomoo account. I funded it. I need to get that wealth transfer blueprint, blueprint video that outlines your three big boy blue chip assets you're buying. Send that to me. Plus, send me the Moomoo tutorial so that I can learn how to use this thing and get myself off to the races. I'm going to send you both videos. Just send me an email, email address down in the description box. Well, thank you guys for stepping in today and, 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 and stopping by and checking out the video. Um, I hope it was helpful. I'll be back again tomorrow, 1030 a.m. Eastern time with more financial information to help you get to your pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. If you appreciate that, hit that thumbs up button before you get out of here. Before you click out of here, hit that thumbs up button. Let me know I'm on the right track. You're rocking with me. You're down with me. We are down like four flat tires. If we're down like four flat tires, hit me with a thumbs up. Lock it in with a thumbs up if we're down like four flat tires. And in the neighborhood I grew up in, when you tell somebody you down with them like four flat tires, you got their back. You got their back no matter what. Y'all, y'all, y'all homies. Y'all got they, you got their back. When you say we down like four flat tires from the neighborhood I come from, that's respect. That's appreciation. That we ride or die. Lock it in with a thumbs up if you, if you agree with me on that. And, and again, guys, I appreciate y'all for rocking with me. Uh, I hope y'all have a blessed day. Take in this information that I just gave you. Dissect it. Chew on it. You know, digest it. And then get to work. Get down to that Moo Moo link, click on that link, open it up, send me an email. I'm going to send you them two videos I talked about so you can start building well. Well, guys, I appreciate you. Have a good rest of your day. Thoughts become things. If you can see it in your mind, you can hold it in your hands. You guys keep chasing your greatness. Never stop believing in yourself. Stay healthy. Get wealthy. And I'll catch you guys on the next one. Peace.